Well, good morning. Say happy Father's Day to all the fathers assembling with us this morning. Hope you are honored and thanked and treated well today. If you didn't get to enjoy donuts for dads before service, uh, I think there's probably a lot still back there. Donuts, coffee, so uh, go enjoy that. I am medically prohibited from, from enjoying the donuts. I don't want to be guilty of what uh, Mark Abbey talked about in the class in here this morning of paying medical professionals to ignore their advice. I don't want to do that. But I will enjoy the coffee. And we, we appreciate uh, I think Amy and Tracy for getting that ready for us this morning. God loves fathers. And um, you know, after all, he is one. And we want to love fathers too. For some time in our culture, fatherhood has been under assault. I would say for decades in our society. It's not an easy time to be a father. Not that being a father has ever been easy, but there was a time, in our culture at least, uh, where fatherhood was respected and held up and even promoted. Today it is mocked and degraded. It is ridiculed and shortchanged. And any traditional portrayal of fatherhood is considered by many outmoded and old-fashioned. It tells you what this culture thinks of God. Because once again, God is a father. In fact, he is the father. Part of the reason that fathers are so thought of in our culture in our world is because men in general are so thought of. True manhood suffers from all these same slings and arrows in our secular society. The Bible tells us what a man is and thus what a father is. I want us to study the biblical definition of manhood this morning. And we are going to have to search the scripture a bit to do so, not staying just with one passage as normal this morning, but our study will range over the whole Bible. So what I'm offering us today is a biblical definition of manhood. And you'll see as we develop it, it has a lot to say about what a biblical father is. So let's start right into it with the first part of our definition. And that is that according to God's word, a man is an adult male. You might say to that, well, duh. But... You've been paying attention to the world, right? And so we better not take anything for granted when we consider what the Bible says about these things. We better not take any definition for granted anymore. A man is an adult male. The key verse here is from the first chapter of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 27, it says there, so God created man in his own image. Now the word for man in that part of the verse is generic. So it could be translated human being without reference to, gen uh, without reference to gender. It's uh, the word Adam, which we get Adam from. But the verse does not end there, of course. It goes on and it says in the rest of that verse, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Now we get to gender specific words, words that specifically mean male and female. No longer is it just Adam, now it is Zakar, male. 
So in the beginning, Genesis 1, God created man, and he created man male and female. God did that. God is the only creator. No man has ever created another man. No man has ever made male and female. The world is lying to you folks when it says they have done so. They have not. Only God gives gender and God does not make mistakes. Biblically speaking, a man is an adult male. Part two of the definition. A man is an adult male who acts like a man. Now, by this, I don't mean that he pretends to be a man. What I mean is that he accepts his masculinity and he behaves as a man was created to behave. There's a word that is used by the Apostle Paul at the end of First. Uh, the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, the word he uses in this verse found nowhere else in the New Testament, but I think it sheds some light on this part of the definition. The verse says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Now, when you read and study this word that Paul uses only here, it's uh, the word endridzomai. He, he uses it again just in this verse. And then you sort of study it more broadly and, and all the places it was used in first century writings and so forth. You find that it generally means to act with courage, to show strength. Those attributes that previous generations meant when they said, be a man. Now, I know that that attitude, be a man, and that expression can be taken to unbiblical extremes. But would you not agree that the pendulum has swung so far in the opposite direction in our culture today that people in the world barely have an idea of, of what an adult male is supposed to be like anymore. Paul writes, as he teaches the Corinthians here, act like men. Now, that could be applied to both male and female in context, of course. Because what he's saying is this. He's saying, be strong, be brave, be courageous as you live out your walk in Christ. And he's using the way men are to act as an illustration. He's saying, act like men act in living out your walk. The next part of our definition, the Bible says a man is an adult male who acts like a man and who speaks and acts with maturity. There's a, a famous verse in 1 Corinthians, again, verse uh, chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, that sort of comes to mind here, where it says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Paul is really using this, this thought to illustrate a different point uh, entirely in the context of that famous chapter, but the point remains, a man, as defined in scripture, is a mature male. He is someone who has given up the ways of a child. He speaks like a man. He thinks like a man, he reasons like a man. The things of a child, he has left behind. Now sometimes, I see men who fail at this point of the definition. They still act childish. 
Uh, their, their feelings are hurt very easily, like a child's feelings are hurt. They will lash out in anger, like a child might. They, they pout like a child. See, childish behavior. They don't act like men. They don't speak and act with maturity. We need to keep this aspect in mind. Next, a man is an adult male who acts like a man, who speaks and acts with maturity, and who embraces responsibility. Going all the way back to the creation account again, Genesis chapter 1, I want you to think about something else there. Actually, chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. After man was created, he was immediately given stuff to do by God. He, he was given, given things that he was responsible for, right? So Genesis 1 verse 26, it says, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. See, they're giving, given work to do. Now true, that applies to both Adam and Eve, both male and female, and hope you're seeing that several parts of this definition do. Um, they're not necessarily specific to gender, but specific to human beings. Man is given responsibility immediately by God. Go over to the second chapter, chapter 2, of Genesis, verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Responsibility, you see. A biblical man embraces his responsibility, whatever it is. He embraces it. He also functions independently. He embraces responsibility and he functions independently. What do we mean here? Let's go back to creation again. Genesis 2, verse 24. It says, there, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The word for man in that verse is once again the, the one that means specifically male. It's the word, uh, in this case, ish, which can also mean husband. It can mean man or husband. But you see, there is a time when a man leaves home, when a man starts to take care of his own business, when, when he starts to make his own way on the earth. Often that will include taking a wife and making a new family. But he does not depend on mom and dad anymore. He depends on himself. Always, of course, on God. Always on God. That goes without saying. But he functions now independently, you see. We see this even in the life of our Lord, in the life of Jesus uh, and, and we see it in more than one place, but, but one example is Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Jesus is out on his own. He is doing his teaching ministry. And he's told on this particular occasion in Matthew 12 that his mother and his brothers have come and they're outside the house where he is working, where he is at the moment and they're wanting to see him. They're wanting to uh, speak to him. Do you remember what he did and what he said on that occasion? He sort of asserted his independence. He said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he pointed at his disciples and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 
Now, it takes more study to really understand all the reasons he may have said that, but, but you see what he's doing there. At least in part, he is showing his independence. Sometimes I'm concerned with some people, and this again, this can be male or female, who cannot function independently of their family of origin. Even when they should be well into their adulthood years. See, that is a sign of immaturity. It can stunt a person's spiritual growth. It can keep a person from fulfilling the work that God has given them to do. Well, let's recap this so far. We're nearly done, but not completely. Here it is, a man, according to the Bible, is an adult male who acts like a man and who speaks and acts with maturity, embraces responsibility, functions independently, and now the new part can lead a family faithfully. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is writing and speaking about leaders in the church. Specifically, in this case, he is referring to elders. He calls them overseers in this text. And he, he tells what these men should be like. He gives a, a long list of character traits and so forth. But in verses 4 and 5 of 1 Timothy 3, this is what he says. He says he must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? New Testament elders are to be men, males. They are to be husbands and fathers, successful ones who have raised or are raising their children successfully in the Lord, who are managing their family and their household. In other words, they're to be Christian men, husbands and fathers, men who have shown that they can lead a family. When we think of the, the biblical definition of manhood, that's a part of it. it. Doesn't mean at all that a single man cannot be a biblical man. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that in general, this is what biblical manhood entails. And we should not apologize for that. When the Bible defines a word, we shouldn't apologize. That's the great, one of the great pressures on us uh, in the church from the world today is to redefine what the Bible says. We're going to have to push back against that, folks. No matter what. They might start throwing some of us in jail. Are we going to act like men? A man, according to the Bible, is an adult male who acts like a man and who speaks and acts with maturity, embraces responsibility, functions independently, can lead a fam family faithfully and recognizes his accountability. Stressed a moment ago about a man's independence, but this is not independence from God, of course. We're not declaring independence from God. A Bible man realizes he is accountable to God. A Bible man knows these Bible words 
by heart, and he lives them out. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. A Bible man, you see, knows with whom he has to do. He, he knows to whom he ultimately answers. And it's not to the culture. It's to the God of the Bible. And the last phrase of our Bible definition of manhood today is that he recognizes his accountability as an image bearer of God. Again, we've referred to the creation account more than once and for good reason. Uh, one thing that, that we haven't stressed from, from that is that God made man in his image. Genesis 1 verse 26, after his likeness. So mankind, that is male and female, bear the image of the creator God. Uh, today we're focusing on men bearing that image. Have you thought much, guys, about the responsibility you have in this world as an image bearer of God? I really think you ought to. It means something. You bear the image of God before the world. It makes a difference. We represent the God who made us to the world. And even more so, if we're Christian men, if we're remade men, having the image of God restored in us through the work of Jesus Christ, through the grace of God, and the gift of the Holy Spirit within. What an incredible honor that is. What a great responsibility it is to bear his image before this world. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 7 says that men, males in, in context, are the image and glory of God. Guys, this morning, people ought to see God in you. There is a, a true story of a man who got some news that no man ever wants to get. The news was that one of his children, his son, was sick and was sick with a disease that was incurable. He was just a young boy. And uh, this is a Christian man who, who led a godly family. He had to personally deliver the news of the diagnosis to his son. And, and when he did, after they had had some time to cry together, the father asked his son if he was afraid. He was afraid in any way to, to meet his God and his son shook his head and said, no, dad, I'm not afraid. Especially if God is like you. Men, if you bear the image of God before this world, before your wives, before your family, you're doing a a godly work. Bear it well. Wear it well. Let's pray. Holy God, we bow in your presence again. Such a privilege to be a part of your day, to worship your name and to be with one another and encourage one another. Pray that we've truly built one another up today. And Father, we want to be, in whatever way you call us to be, your image bearers in this world.
Help us to learn how better to do that. Help us to, to make changes where we need to make changes. And please encourage us. Thank you for fathers. Their job is not easy. They're such a blessing to us. And we pray you will bless them today. Pray this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. If we can be of assistance to you this morning in your walk with the Lord, if you need the strength of the prayers or the help of the church, please let us know. If you need to commit yourself to the Lord this morning, to, to meet him in the waters of baptism, where you can be restored to that image, what a great day to do it. If we can assist you, please let us know how while we stand, while we sing this song.